Hey YouTube, Electric Adventures here. What did I just do? Did I fly halfway across the world to go to a game expo? Yeah, I did. Right, yes, I um, took it onto myself. Um, well, I was invited by my good friend um, John Lester, Game Straight One, who runs the Game On Expo, um, to come over uh, to the US for the first time in 20 years. Travelled out of Australia. <coughs> I have been overseas a fair bit, but all of that was 20 years ago. So it has been a little while. That was what comes with having four kids and um, busy jobs and everything like that. Um, <coughs> but um, obviously, uh, self-serving. I wanted to go over there and, and you know meet some people <coughs> and also spruik my book, um, which goes to print probably in about a week's time. Finally, um, but I'll do a specific video when I know that it's actually gone gone. Um, and thank you to everybody who has supported my book so far. The response has been very good. But anyway, that's not what this video is about. This video is about me hopping on <coughs> a couple of planes, flying all the way over to Phoenix, Arizona. Um, now my journey started at 4am my time. Um, getting up, have a quick shower. Uh, my wife um, <coughs> uh, luckily gave me a lift to the airport at the, uh, as they call it, the kiss and drop off area, so it flung me out the door. Um, and then I had a flight that's, uh, that left at 6am on time, which was great, always nice to see. Um, the airline in question for this link was Qantas. I haven't actually been on a Qantas plane for a while, it was actually quite well run um, and smooth service. Uh, got into Melbourne and I was actually surprised, my bag had already been checked all the way through um, to, uh, to to at least LAX. I wasn't expecting that. I was expecting to have to go and collect my bag and then go recheck it. No, it was it was checked all the way in, so I didn't have to worry about that. So I just had my carry on, um, and I pretty much made my. Uh, and this is at Melbourne Airport. Melbourne Airport's actually not that big, um, and it doesn't take long. To, it, it's basically got three main terminal sections. The middle one's the international one. So whether you arrive on uh, the other two airlines or Qantas. You, you don't have far to walk before you can get into the international area and I walked straight in there, it was very early in the morning, the whole airport was only just uh, pretty much waking up. So pretty much by 8 o'clock I was sitting at the gate lounge, uh, ready to go and I was thinking, oh, I was expecting a little bit more uh, stress getting through there. But that was good and um, then I boarded my flight to the US um, and it was via the airline United, which I have not flown before. <clears throat> and actually, I was quite impressed. The, um, the amount of legroom is pretty good. Um, now, it's a long flight, uh, 14 and a half hours uh, from Melbourne to LAX. I, uh, and I was, I, I was lucky to have a seat next to me that was free and another person on the other side of the aisle. I was in the middle of the plane. Um, uh, <clears throat> try my hardest. I, I couldn't sleep. Um, I did try but it was very difficult, um, tall person, um, bad back, yeah, it just didn't work. So I had um, naps, I watched uh, I watched a movie to start with to try and tire myself out, um, and the only other thing I watched on the in-flight attempt was when well, um, having breakfast at the other end. Um, I actually watched the first episode of The Last of Us, I've watched the season before, um, but I, w I started watching that again because that was available and I quite liked it. And um, it's still pretty good. And by the way, it's two days after I got back. I'm still a little snuffly in the nose. I do apologise. So, um, after all that, I so 14 and a half hours, I arrived in LAX. Unfortunately, in LAX, um, I had a 12 hour layover. <clears throat> uh, and that was excruciating. Um, now, the good thing was, is once again, I had to go collect my bag, um, go through customs, and then you wheel it out and they say, right, check baggage here, and they take it back off you again. So that was great. Um, I then walked from, um, and there's quite a few terminals at LAX, from one end to the other, which is good. I really needed to stretch anyway. 
Uh, my main problem on arriving, though, was that even though I have a phone that has both Australian providers, Telstra and Optus, and I turned on international roaming on both of them before I left, it didn't work. <laughs> so I had to navigate trying to connect to Wi-Fi points to even be able to find out uh, where my next plane was, because everything was electronic. You don't think of these things. But um, I worked all that out, and I had plenty of time to do so. And then I ended up in, I think, Terminal 7. And, um, yeah, 12, you know, I didn't even use an hour getting there. So um, pretty much 11 and a bit hours uh, in that terminal. Um, I, uh, I played my Switch a little bit. Um, I um, used my computer for a little bit. I read my book for a little bit. I ate some food. And my word, uh, meal sizes in the US large. <coughs> I, I ordered this burrito, because I actually quite like burritos, and one of the things, and it came with all these extras. I could not eat the extras, and I struggled to get through the burrito. So, yeah, very nice though. Um, yeah, so finally, I bought it by flight from LAX to Phoenix. And I ended up arriving, so I left on my Thursday at 4 a.m., and I arrived at the hotel in Phoenix at about 11 p.m. on the same Thursday. So I went back in time, which is uh, fairly cool if you think about it. So, you know, I, I got there in an entire day, but my trip lasted 34 hours. Yeah, 34 hours from yo to go, not a lot of sleep. Suffice to say that as soon as I got in my hotel room, it's actually quite funny, I couldn't work the shower out, so I had a cold shower. I was just so tired, I was probably, you know, beyond... Uh, six drinks worth of drunkenness um, and um, got into bed and went to sleep almost immediately thank god <coughs> woke up in the morning uh, the hotel um, it's I stayed at Hyatt Place um, not the Hyatt right next to the convention centre but it's only like another 300 metres further away um, got up and they have really nice breakfast included there um, I had some of that, some, some eggs and some, um, uh, you know, American-style bacon, which was good. And then I took, walked out the door and, once again, you know, as soon as I walked out the door, Wi-Fi stopped working. Maps on my phones weren't working and I turned the wrong way out of the door. So that's a very good way of um, getting an impromptu tour of downtown Phoenix. Um, and I still was fairly early. Uh, but I did I work at it. It is square. It, the, the whole thing's laid down in squares, and um, you know the streets are, are, are named mostly in first, second, third. So you can work out when you're going the wrong way. So I worked that out, and I arrived at the convention centre. <coughs> um, uh, worked out which it was a bit confusing to start with. Worked out which line was the VIP line, and I was actually only the sixth person in line. And then we waited. Um, and I did actually see John Lester, um, he came walking out and came over and shook my hand and said hello and then raced off, tearing around. Um, they had a problem with security on the first day. Um, uh, they only had a couple of walk-through stations in the first entrance and the security refused to open until 12 o'clock, even though they told everybody 11, so people could actually go in and get their passes. Um, VIP passes were available to collect the previous day, but obviously I got in too late and missed that. Um, so I had to wait till 12, um, and then the security guard started letting everybody in rather than running the VIP line first, but I mean, I was only the sixth person in. But anyway, that was a bit of a schmozzle on the first day. It's not John's fault. It's the um, it's the security thing, and they fixed the situation the next day, but I do know lots of people had a bit of trouble getting in. So when I finally did get in, I went and I grabbed my pass. I went to the... Um, the, you know, the speaker table first, and I got my uh, pass, which was just an, a normal, uh, you know, full event pass. And then I realised that John had actually given me a, um, a VIP, because uh, I mean, um, entry as well. So I went over to the uh, another desk, and they gave me this. Sorry, something thing is that, that you get this nice bag, which you can, you know, configure so you can hold it on your back. And in there was this uh, nice hat. I actually really like this hat. Sorry, I'm holding things away. I won't wear a hat on, on camera, but um, nice hat. There's this um, 
phone holder thingy. Um, obviously the pass, sorry. So this gets you early access to the event each day. And it has a lovely Sydney Hunter lanyard. Both of them do. So I've got two Sydney Hunter lanyards. Um, you have this rather good um, Game On Expo microfiber, which is actually really handy. So that's a nice size. <coughs> oh, pardon me. <coughs> As I said, I, I do have a little bit of a, a chest thing. Um, and you've got a Switch game. I haven't played it yet. We have opened it. My wife was actually quite curious. Um, so it comes in a special slip cover. So rain on your parade. You're a cloud and you have to go and rain on people's parade. And then you've got the, the game itself. Oh, there was actually something else in there. Which I've put somewhere else. Anyway. Um, there was a little uh, tag in there. I'll, I'll find that later. But haven't played it yet, I said. Only been back a couple of days. Haven't really had the chance to play any games. But that was really cool. So that was all in the welcome pack. There was an, an Omen poster as well. Uh, that got completely squashed on the way back. So I haven't shown you. So that, yeah, there was a, uh, a poster. Um, I'm sure there was a sticker as well. I'm, as you can see, completely disorganised here. Here we go. So there's a Game on Expo sticker. So they've got their branding down pat. So there we go, I'm at the event, I'm finally in, and um, sorry, I need a coffee. <clears throat> I definitely need coffee. And walked in to this great big giant um, event hall, and it is massive. And I have taken some walk around footage, which I'll, I'll add to the end for those that are interested. Um, my only thing, thinking, because my um, my phone was only working on Wi-Fi and I couldn't get Wi-Fi down there I actually didn't take it out very much <coughs> because you know if you're not checking your phone all the time you're not thinking so I didn't take a lot of actual photographs uh, one of the first areas that I zoned, um, I did go and have a look at were of course the arcade and pinball machines um, and there was a, there was a decent lineup. up um, there were a couple of original arcade games there and a few modern ones as well um, and some very nice pinball machines and the one that I'll, uh, I'll mark as my favourite because it's one of my favourites on electronic and it was great to finally be able to play that for the first time was the modern Star Trek pinball um, I actually really enjoy that one on virtual pinball um, and would love to own one of those physically and uh, uh, much to the surprise that pretty much all of those pinballs were for sale but of course they're in the US and they're in US dollars so it's not just buying the pinball it's how in the world do you get it home so never say never at least I know where one of those Star Trek pinballs are um, and uh, and I do know that um, and I, I, by the way I played the Jaws one and I do know that John bought that Jaws one because he, he showed a picture last night that he, he bought that and has added it to his um, arcade collection at home that was actually quite a good fun pinball um, so I had a bit of a look around there and um, walking towards that er uh, area um, and he recognised me was Adam Korolik. I do have notes here so I pronounce people's names correctly. Now Adam and I have known each other for quite some time. We haven't communicated much for a while but I actually helped him out with getting, him, uh, getting some Australian um, Xbox games and sending them over to him. So he remembers that from ages ago, and he recognised me and said hello. He was really friendly, really nice guy. Um, his stand um, with his um, uh, Shiro magazine um, and um, Sega Power, I think they're called, uh, podcast mates, was over in the um, sort of like free play and tournament area. The, the only non-tournament stand in their area and um, later on, which I'll go into, they, they moved over um, to another area which is more convenient to them. But these guys, this is actually a really good magazine by the way. Um, I read that um, on, on the way back and um, actually thoroughly enjoyed it. So I highly recommended it. Um, obviously posted on the Sega Saturn which those guys are very enthusiastic about. Now the key things that Adam had there 
uh, were two very rare items indeed. You have the um, Sega uh, Saturn Pluto, uh, which is very uh, like a, proto a prototype console. Um, I don't know a lot about it, but it was very cool. Plays Sega Saturn games, and uh, I believe um, combined some of the older um, Sega consoles as well. There's only about six in in existence, and also he has one of the actual Jaguar shell dental dental machines, uh, of which there are only a couple of as well. So that that was very interesting bits of history. Um, he lent the um, the Sega Jaguar shell to uh, John Hancock for a little while later on, um, and we will get to John Hancock in a little bit. Um, and um, yeah, it was very good, very interesting. Um, played some Sega Saturn stuff. I mean, I'm a pretty big Sega Saturn collector. Collector, I just haven't got any games for it for a while, but I have um, a very large PAL set and a um, Japanese um, Saturn set, which is where my focus is on the Japanese Saturn. Um, Power Saturn is actually an area that I've been, you know, slowly selling off just to make some room and uh, to improve my focus. So, uh, so Adam was the first person I met, which is really nice. Um, oh, other than uh, John, very brief, um, John Lester, very briefly um, outside the entrance. Um, and I walked around and walking around the aisles, and there are lots of um, vendors, and they are very good at. Um, at uh, meshing them so you know you don't have the same stuff in the same location all the time so you know you had to walk around to have a look and that um, you know vendors selling different things and there were a lot of games there um, you've got to remember I live in a place that actually does not have a retro game store at all um, the only avenue I have for buying games physically in my hand are what I call our tip shops which generally get stuff for free that people dump on the tip and then clean it up and put it for sale at eBay prices. Um, so we don't frequent them very often anyway and if you were lucky you can go to some of the markets on the weekends and there might be somebody there who brings us along some games but it's very thin on the ground. So having not just one vendor but multiple vendors with all sorts of different stuff. Now in the walk around You'll notice my um, focus in the walk around definitely favours any place selling any retro games, so, so you get a good look there um, when we do that. But there were quite a few sellers. There was actually a really nice um, Japanese-focused uh, one. I um, visited those guys multiple times. They actually had an MSX machine there. Um, uh, one of the um, nice Panasonic units that looks like stereo gear that they kept on asking. People kept on saying, was it a... Um, was it a piece of stereo gear and people didn't realise it was an MSX. I actually suggested that they put an MSX signed on it. They also had a really nice box um, uh, SG-1000 uh, Mark III uh, with everything in it. That was really good. Uh, I already have one of those. Um, I told one of my local friends back here if he would like it, but it was just a bit too much money for him. And probably good that I didn't get it because I would have struggled to bring it home. There was actually a, a really nice uh, white satin there in a box complete that was only $100 US. Um, <clears throat> because of my bad reception, I had to go upstairs to hook up to any Wi-Fi to send messages. Uh, by the time I did that, well, I realised my messages weren't sending, and then I went up and did that, connected, he said, oh, I'd really like that. I walked around, they'd sold it, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> then there's the breaks, and I did look through their Saturn titles and PC Engine titles that they had, um, but I actually had most of the titles uh, that were there, and the other ones there weren't the type of games um, that I was into. Um, there was a nice copy of um, of Metal Slug for the Saturn, which I don't have, um, but it was just you know I've got to watch exchange rate and everything like that. It was a hundred dollars. I. I probably could have haggled and everything like that, but I was very, um, I held off buying anything on the first day pretty much exclusively and until a bit later. Right, so then I kept on walking around and um, um, in the final corner I ran into um, both John Hancock and John Reeks uh, with their stalls selling their, um, their various um, homebrew efforts. Um, and uh, talked to both of them and um, got on really well. Um, both of them are very friendly guys. Um, 
and um, very approachable. Um, uh, John Riggs uh, went off and got a uh, he got a, a, a new he gets a show tattoo, so we went off to do a show tattoo, and I actually talked to John Hancock for a while, and him and I. But, uh, I will say, well, at the end of the show, uh, kindred spirits and um, probably very good mates, a lot in common, and we, we actually spent a lot of time uh, together. Uh, I ended up um, having dinner with John Hancock on Friday night, and then again on Saturday night with some more extras. Um, now, later in that afternoon, uh, Johnny Millennium, in other words, Happy Console Gamer, had his panel. Um, <clears throat> his panel suffered a little bit from the fact that people couldn't get in and also was on the same time as the Metal Gear reunion panel. Um, <clears throat> so there weren't a tremendous number of people in there, but that was nice. It was a nice, small, friendly panel. Um, and, um, you know, uh, Johnny was um, there with a moderator. I'm sorry, names escaped me. Um, and it was a really nice talk and chatted to him afterwards. He seems like a very nice, approachable guy. Um, and um, and then he said, oh, come on, the, p- p- the gaggle of people, that there was probably about five of us, and he said, let's go for a walk. He wanted to go for a walk, so we walked around, and we actually walked back to where John Hancock and John Riggs were, and, um, and said hello, and then, he, we, you know, I actually don't like to crowd people, if you know what I mean, um, and let him go off and do his own thing. Um, Paul Johnny probably had a gaggle around him the entire show, um, which was, um, you know, would have been very tiring, but obviously it's the first time he's been to a convention for seven years. Um, and he seems a very nice guy, um, and him and I had a few conversations uh, throughout the show, and even on, on the last day he came and um, sat near where I was sitting with, with John Reeves and John Hancock and uh, talked for a little while about um, raising kids and things like that. So, um, And... Um, uh, I also gave him, because uh, I know he, he has an MSX, and I an MSX, I gave him a copy of my MSX technical book and um, a copy of my um, my adventure game for him to try out at some stage. Um, and I basically said, I know you, you don't like accepting gifts, but yeah, I got him to accept them, so that's all right. And as I said, him and I had some great conversations, which was really good. And that's, I mean, I was there mainly to meet people and experience one of these shows for the first time myself. Um, and actually, um, talking to Johnny went so long, I actually missed Adam's, uh, Adam Corolex's actual um, panel. So I don't know how many people went to that one. That was straight after uh, John's. So, um, uh, and it was in a different room. Um, so I missed that one. It was directly after it. So, um that was basically it for the Friday, as far as that. And I looked around, played some pinball, looked at some of the vendors. Now, I did buy something on the first day. Because um, actually, funnily enough, the other guys are going, Oh, what do you bought? What do you think? And I said, Well, look, you know, I like the older stuff. Um, there was heaps of NES cartridges, right? There was heaps of Super Nintendo cartridges, and there were heaps of games for the more modern disc systems. Now, obviously, the disc system games, if they're US-based... Unless I've got an NTSC console, that makes it very difficult. So I definitely wasn't focused on disc games. Um, obviously, did um, you know th- there were disc games in the ja- that Japanese store that I po- talked about earlier? But I was going past one st- stall, and then I noticed they had an Atari 7800 game. Um, and I really do like the Atari 7800. I, I do only have a PAL 7800, um, and this game is a US NTSC only game. But I do have the Atari 2600 Plus, which allows me to play NTC games um, and, of course, 7800 games. So none other than Robotron 2084, and it's in not too bad condition. It, the top flaps, you know, hasn't had the best time, but the um, the spine is in really good condition. And we have, I haven't tried it yet. But the cartridge is good. No, oh, sorry. Getting things to focus. Um, and it has the manual as well. So I think that was 
that was 30 US so that has cost me about $40 and went, I'm okay with that I wouldn't be able to buy on eBay or whatever and import that for that amount of money so and I really do like Robotron and I've never played this game because I have a PAL 7800 and this is one of the games that will not work on a power unit and they never released a PAL version so I'm actually looking forward to playing this I'm a, as I said, really big fan of Robotron and I play it of my uh, multi Williams uh, cocktail back there with the special Robotron controls. Now I have to work out how you hook two controllers up and have some sort of a holder so you can play it um, dual stick mode. So we'll get into that. So that was my only pickup from the first day. <coughs> so when the show finished, um, I walked with um, John Hancock back to the hotel. The hotel started with the first name. His was right next to the expo. Didn't realise that. So we actually took him on a, a, a couple of block walk towards my hotel when we realised that his was the other one. But that's okay. Walked halfway back and said our, um, said our goodbyes and said, look, did you, and, he, and he basically offered, did you want to um, meet back at his hotel downstairs and um, potentially some of the guys were going to have um, dinner. So I went back to the hotel, um, <clears throat> you know, freshened up, walked down there, and we're only talking three or four hundred metres, um, and just as I walked in the door, John Hancock was had just come out of the lift. He was hungry. It was like 9 p.m. hadn't eaten anything. Um, I did have to have a snack at about 5 p.m. because uh, I didn't have any lunch and my uh, body had run out of juice. My that was the hardest thing I found because of the time zone differences. My body didn't know when I was hungry and when I needed to eat. And we had a nice um, in the restaurant at the bottom of the. Um, of the Hyatt there was um, a very nice little restaurant and we had um, an American sandwich which is a I mean they sell normal sandwiches as well but they have a sandwich burger I suppose um, I had a chicken one and he had a beef one and they were both very nice wasn't very expensive um, I couldn't quite finish mine again but I had had that other <coughs> you know like chicken strips and chips um, at five o'clock so that was really nice and him and I chatted for a while uh, until our, our eyes started to droop a bit um, we didn't see anybody else apparently they were actually sitting outside and they were much later got to point out that <clears throat> most of the other people are younger than us um, you know so us old people need to go to bed earlier so we said we said our goodbyes <laughs> and uh, went back to the hotel had a, a decent sleep um, got up in the morning and went to the expo again on the Saturday. Now, um, once again, there's a lineup, but they had doubled. No, actually, they were up to six different entry, uh, security scanners. They definitely had a specific um, VIP section lines, um, and all the vendors had to go through that as well. And when um, and they were letting in um, all those people an hour before the event so that was great got in got in there nice open and this is when I've taken the video that you'll see at the end um, when everything was uh, whenever you'll see lots of people setting up and everything like that and not a lot of people in the event um, I'm glad I did it then because later in the day it got absolutely packed Saturday was obviously the busiest day there were the most people there and there were a lot of people there <clears throat> and everybody was very busy um, obviously I went and said hello to John Hancock and John Riggs again um, I tried not to loiter around too much because obviously they've got people to talk to and run their stalls I went off and um, I actually had a quite decent uh, session on the pinballs that morning as well after I'd done I obviously done my video walk around um, and I decided to do a little bit more uh, because I'd been looking at the video as I walked around I did notice um, some more Atari games at one of the vendors which was very near uh, the start <clears throat> and um, I went and had a look and they had um, no I am a very big Tron fan Tron is a movie um, where I think I get a lot of my uh, retro game nostalgia from especially arcade uh, retro nostalgia um, I really love the original movie. I love the um, the newer movie as well, um, and do hope that the um, the next movie 
uh, it continues to be made. I do believe it's under construction. Um, now, <coughs> I don't actually have any Atari 2600 um, Tron games, and there were a couple. There were these two here. They're both sealed. Um, I've never played them. So we have oops, Tron Deadly Dis. And I said they're still, and they'll stay, they'll stay sealed. I can play using a harmony card or something. Right. And, and I'm not sure whether there's any other games, but I have these two. So we have Adventures of Tron, which looks more like a platform type game. Once again, I have not played these, and they're sealed. They're, and they're in pretty good condition. <coughs> um, so I can't remember how much these were originally, but I'll tell you what the final bundle was. And look at those two games, and I'm saying I was talking to the guy that I really love Tron and everything, and he said, "Oh, have you seen that? Look, we've got this. We've got this Tron controller over here uh, as a display. He had it as a display piece. He didn't actually have it there for sale. Didn't have it priced." And I said, oh, "Of course." I said, "What would you like for that?" And I had these two Tron games, and he said, "And he's I'm an armor Aaron." Oh, sorry better actually show you so it is at the end of the day just an Atari 2600 controller it has a a winder to store the cable I have no idea whether it works and it has the, the button on the front and the Tron M network label there it's actually pretty good and it's got good suction cups on the bottom of it um, Sorry, I'm still getting used to this new camera. <coughs> anyway, it has a serial number on there, 0763L6, uh, <coughs> 1983. Um, I just love Tron stuff, so I don't care whether it works. I haven't tested it yet. I will give it a go. It's actually quite cool how the cable goes in there. But anyway, <coughs> he basically said, he's gone, I'm on an R and he doesn't really know what to sell this for and I've got those two games and he says, how about $50? And I went, alright, I'll go for that. So I got two sealed 2600 games and this controller for 50 bucks. I'm extremely happy with that. So that's probably, let's do our conversion, <coughs> that's probably about $72 Australian. Once again, this weighs a bit, wouldn't be able to get those over here in Australia for anywhere near that. So, very happy with those. They, they, they are basically um, my personal purchase pickups of the things. We have a few gifts to come. And I said, I know this is getting a, a bit of a long rant here. Alright, <coughs> so there were some more panels on the second day. So the first one, <coughs> and I'm losing my voice again. <coughs> Oh, and actually, sorry, before this, as I was walking around, um, I pretty much ran smack bang into Riff and Ricky from, I know them as NES Pursuit, uh, um, and uh, obviously at the moment they go under the name of Pixel Game Squad. Um, uh, those guys obviously never met any of these people I'm talking about in person before, including John Lester. Um, and uh, you know, walked up to these guys, and they sort of looked at me and was going, "Oh, we sort of recognise that face," because um, I know them from back when I used to do YouTuber of the Month, and they actually won YouTuber of the Year. So we did a bit of back and forth communication. So I suppose they recognised my face, and we said hello to each other and and chatted for a bit. And they had their little blue cart, and they were going round and. And Riff was saying that he's already spent quite a bit of money buying a few NES games. So I actually really look forward to the next episode of that. The, the, um, the Pixel Game Squad, they've been focusing on... Because um, they, they, they had quite a few NES games. They've sold them and let them go at various stages. And they realised they wanted to get back to their roots. And they have restarted their NES pursuit. <clears throat> just like they were doing back in the old, old days and they're trying to actually collect a full set of NES games um, as of the last video that I watched just before this there are about, about 140 games so they've got a long way to go 
Uh, but I do know that um, uh, Riff and Ricky picked up a few games there. I couldn't quite see it in the trolley. I wasn't trying to sneak or anything like that. But I chatted with both those guys, shook their hands, um, talked about um, uh, Sydney Hunter and the Cavs of Death for the NES. Um, and because, uh, by the way, all finished. We'll be coming out in physical form very soon. And it was just cool running into those and just, you know, meeting people um, that you watch online in person for the first time. <clears throat> it's a very refreshing experience, and I can say they are just exactly like they appear on camera. Very nice, both very, very nice guys. So I was very happy to run into them. That was the only time <clears throat> I ran into those guys. I think they're only there for the day. They must have, um, you know, driven over, come to that. A few, the, a few other members of uh, the EC on the Pixel Game Squad were around for the rest of the show. And we're getting to those guys. Um... <clears throat> <coughs> Sorry. Um, now I, I did run into um, Gabo, Gabo the Giver, as he's known on the Pixel Game Squad, uh, very briefly on that day. Um, and then I went to another talk, and this was by Mort from Mort's Garage, along with Dan and Elise from JRPG Life. I've been subscribed to them for a while. Um, they do um, very good professional videos, and they did a talk on running a YouTube channel and uh, you know the do's and don'ts and they were very good um, and um, you know hung around afterwards and um, uh, oh, oh I answered one question if you can say it was a question they basically got people to put up their hand and say okay how long have you had a YouTube channel and they went one year two year they got up to ten and my arm was still up and then they said how many years and I said twelve so yes so for that I got <clears throat> and, I was, and I was being polite so uh, Dan and Elise had this hat so this is Final Fantasy Rebirth um, although I do like Final Fantasy I'm not that into that um, and then I was talking to Mort afterwards and he gave me one of his hats anyway so and Mort's a really nice guy once again he was looking at me as if he recognised me so I don't know what, <clears throat> you know Mort's appeared on the Nest Pursuit, um, but I don't think I've ever talked to him uh, directly anymore, but he's a really, really nice guy. Um, had, a, had a great chat to him, and um, yeah, check out his channel, Mort's Garage. Um, he's got, he's, he has a full um, uh, US N64 set in box, which is pretty amazing. <coughs> Favourite hat still, though, is that one. And I believe one of my friends wants to steal the Final Fantasy Rebirth um, hat off me. Um, uh, and then directly after that was a uh, session with uh, Nin Nintendo, um, who is also a fellow dev. Um, he's uh, released a game on Steam called Carl, uh, which is actually a really, really cool game. Um, he's a big, um, you know, Nintendo 64 guy as well. Um, talked to him afterwards as well and then he ended up coming out with us for the dinner with John Hancock and uh, John Lester joined uh, that dinner as well later that night as well so I talked to him for, for ages um, um, and really nice guy um, I gave him a copy of my book he gave me a copy of his game um, which sorry <coughs> I, I only briefly played I have downloaded it on my computer but it's really cool, um, his game. I like the art style and the gameplay. Um, and, uh, yeah, we talked We talked for a very long time. Um, I, I am, <coughs> not to talk about it very much, a very big Nintendo 64 fan. It's probably one of the main consoles that I played at home, and especially with my wife. Um, at the time, I was doing uh, work on a 3D paint package so the release of the Nintendo 64 and Mario 64 uh, was very exciting and groundbreaking at the time. So it's a system that really, <coughs> you know, uh, appealed to me. And I played, um, we pl I played Mario, played um, the Zelda games. My wife played the Zelda games, um, and we we played Donkey Kong 64. And then I got into the Star Wars games, and um, no, very very good console. Um, probably don't talk about it very much because I don't have my original uh, Power N64 games. Although I have collect, recollected some of the key ones because they were stolen. 
but I do have quite a large Japanese M64 set. Um, <clears throat> that's a thing of like part of my collection I need to uh, focus on a bit more, but my Nintendo bits and pieces are scattered around the room. I've been trying to get the wood to build a new Nintendo shelf for quite some time, so I need to get back to that. So anyway, um, oh, and on that day we also had a panel with um, John Hancock, John Riggs, and Radical Reggie. Now Reggie, I'd seen Reggie around. Obviously, he hangs around with Metal Jesus a lot, but he's got his own channel. He'd been sitting in the audience of some of the others and, and commenting things like that. But it was good to um, in a panel. This was one of the best panels. Lots of questions. Um, probably better time of the day <clears throat> to get more people in there. That was really good. Um, and um, actually. Uh, sort of chilled with um, Reggie later on um, when he was playing some beat-em-ups on the Sega uh, on the Sega gear and that was when the Sega Patler guys and Adam Torek they moved over next to uh, John Riggs and John Hancock because there was actually a spare spot there and they, they were sick and tired of people going over and asking whether they were part of the tournament so they were sort of cut off from everybody else so they came over and we sort of you know we, we became a bit of a um, uh, a, a section um, where there was, you know, lot, you know fellow mind, minded retro people. And also directly across from us was a stand with Chris Tang and Kiyoshi Okuma, who have been working on Strike Blazinger for quite a while, and they had a Strike Blazinger stand there. Um, so Chris Tang has been involved in quite a, the production of quite a few video games and um, is known as the Sega World Champion as well. Um, really nice guy, talked to those guys for ages as well about their game and how the development's going and everything like that. And um, I'll be following that. They've been working on the game for a while, um, but it's really coming together and they've been demoing at shows to get support. So um, they're full on into, um, you know, level construction and fleshing out the, uh, the graphic assets and things like that. Um, so that evening we went out to uh, went out to dinner at the same place, um, talked for ages. John Lester walked past and said, "Oh, finally!" So I finally got to properly meet him in person, which was really nice. Hang out with him for a while um, with Nintendo and John Hancock, <coughs> um, and um, yep, then we called it a night. And um, some of the other guys were there. Uh, they came later at another table, and uh, were, <coughs> were having a drinking session. Um, John Hank and I, once again, we don't really partake in the drinks. We did have a couple of brews, though, uh, <coughs> which I regretted because um, I didn't sleep very well that night. So then we come to the final day, Sunday. So one of the most important things, the first thing on that day was my talk. So I did a presentation at 10.30 on Sunday. I got a reasonable crowd um, and um, and quite a few questions asked where I did a presentation on my book and what my book was all about. That's of course, uh, for those who haven't seen my previous videos, classic game programming on the NES. Um, Pre-sales have been going very well, so once again, thank you for everybody who has supported the book so far and physical ones, will it'll go to print at the end of this month. I'm just waiting for the graphical person to sign off on all the graphics in it um, we've done all the editing. I haven't got a proof, the final proof yet, though. So hopefully I'll get that this week. Uh, but once it's gone live, live to print, I'll do another specific video on that. <clears throat> um, so that talk went very well. Uh, a couple of the other guys came and watched. Was really nice of them. Um, uh, John Hancock commended me on my presentation style and everything like that. So that's very nice. I haven't done a presentation like that for a very long time. I thoroughly enjoyed that, um, and then basically uh, the rest of the day I went and hung out with the guys. Now I did go and do a bit more of a shop because I thought I've come all this way, I can't go home without buying some NES games because it's not as if I can buy them anywhere here except off eBay. And you're going to be really shocked at the three that I bought, the fact, really? You don't have copies of those games? But no, I never have, and to buy them over here would have cost me a fortune. So I basically got these games for $50 US total. So I did the how much for these three bundle and I'm happy with $50 for these three. So the first one, and this is probably the biggest surprise, 
Castlevania. No, I do not have a copy of Castlevania for the NES. Sad but true. Um, and labels in. I mean, I picked these out because this is a stall that had multiple copies of these, by the way, and they all looked in very good condition. Um, so next one, funnily enough, is Castlevania Two, which I don't think I've actually ever played. I don't know how good it is. Sorry, this camera is not very good at holding up stuff, is it? I do apologise. I need to do a new setup with my um, with my iPhone, I think. But that label on that's really good. Not even dings on it. I haven't played them or tried them yet. And then another game, which is you know probably harks to my games I like playing a lot more and I've never played this as, as well probably for, uh, briefly on emulation is Super C so that's the second Contra game once again labels excellent so I have no idea whether $50 for those three loose is a good deal you guys tell me so that's probably about so $50 again probably about $72 absolutely no way I could buy those online and get them shipped to me for that so I'm very happy with those um, <clears throat> now um, so Sunday started to go on um, John Riggs had to go for an early flight and the team from uh, that made the game FX unit Yuki which uh, Chris Tang also assisted working on uh, moved their display to John Riggs table and of course you know uh, wasn't moving around much by then obviously uh, to go and play I played a little bit more pinball on the Sunday of course as you do and they had copies of their FX Yuki game as you can see still steeled I have not played it yet and they had PC Engine oh, and I actually talked to them and said oh the PC Engine is definitely the best one and I said oh it's fantastic I haven't bought a PC Engine game for ages and let alone a PC Engine homebrew this is my first PC Engine homebrew um Obviously, PC Engine CD. Um, it's a platform action shooting game, I believe. It's been out for a couple of years. Um, <clears throat> and they had Dreamcast and Genesis versions there. So this was $40. And I said, yeah, $40. And they said, but because I'd been talking to these guys for a little while and they realised I was another dev. Um, and they nicely said, oh, no, no, just $30 will do for you. And I said, oh, thanks, right. And I'd, so I was really happy to get that for $30, a new PC Engine game. And he turned around and said, oh, you might as well have the Dreamcast version as well. So, there we go. I've got the Dreamcast version. So, we'll, <coughs> when I get a chance, I'm going to do a first plays of this one. And do we'll do them one after each other and give them a go straight away. I'm very much looking forward to playing those. As you can see, they've still got the plastic on. The plastic will be coming off because I'll be, I'll be playing them. Um, now, this is their new game that they're working on. I don't know much about it, but the art, I love their art style. So Saru, Saru Pro Games, you want for their tag. Really nice bunch of guys, very creative. Um, <clears throat> now I did um, give uh, John Hancock some of my uh, MSX games, uh, which was he was very happy about things. And <clears throat> I was actually waiting till the last day because I did actually want one of his games and I wanted to at least come home with one of his games um, but it was the game he was selling the most copies of and I didn't want to take you know, a sale away from him but it was, it was up to the stage of packing up and he had one copy of the Catacombs of Chaos left and I said I'd like to buy that off you and he insisted on giving this to me and he has signed it as you can see um, and these cases are pretty hefty. Once again, have not played it yet. But I'm going to do a specific video of just playing this one. And once again, I've got the Atari 2600+. Plus. So this finally allows me to play NTSC games and things like this. It is very difficult being power territory so much. But these is, this is the quality that John Hancock does with his homebrews. These are actually really nice cases. Um, <clears throat> they work quite well. And he... He did quite well. He sold quite a few of his games. Um, he had another um, another game there um, that he's selling for charity as well. 
and um, his newest game, Blockum Sockum. Lots of copies of that, of that available, but this is like a dungeon call, and it's an Atari 2600 game. And if you haven't got, I love my Atari 2600, Atari 7800, so very much looking forward to playing this. Um, he also gifted me his USB stick with his games on it as well, so he was overly generous, and I you know, now consider him a very good mate, and will continue to communicate into the future. Um, I'd like to say that both John Hancock and John Riggs both graciously provided back quotes for my book. Uh, it was one of the reasons why, you know, I did seek them out and talk to them a lot to thank them for that, which I very much appreciate. But I'm looking forward to playing that. All right, I do believe I have managed to make it to the end of this <coughs> rather long waffle, but as I said, it was a big trip. Um, oh, well, we haven't done the trip home yet. Yes. That took just as long, so um, uh, I caught a, uh, well, basically a, one more night in Phoenix, uh, slept in a little bit, probably a bit too much, missed breakfast, they'd actually packed up the breakfast by the time I went down. Stayed at the hotel as long as I could, Checkout was 11, so just before 11, um, caught an Uber to the airport, um, but then unfortunately my flight wasn't till 7pm. Uh, so I had a bit of a wait there. That wasn't too bad. I, I was reasonably well rested by then. Um, <clears throat> I actually uh, started doing some dev work on the laptop um, and caught that flight. So at 7 p.m. Um, left Phoenix and flew to LAX. A really exciting thing that happened on that plane, probably about 20 minutes after we took off, the captain came over the intercom and said, out the left-hand side of the plane, I believe we're looking at a rocket launch. Now, I didn't have the window seat. The lady next to me had the blind shut, but she immediately opened and started looking. And yes, I saw a SpaceX Falcon 9 um, rocket going up past the plane. Uh, it was really cool. Um, so obviously, big space nut as well. So another little tick off the list of things that I would like to do and see in my life. So there we go. Um, and that we were able to watch that for quite some time. Um, then I made it to made it to LAX and um, my bag was automatically checked into the international flight which was cool there was only a little bit of a wait and the international flight left at 10 30 p.m local time um, unfortunately on the way back you're going against the wind so that flight was 15 and a half hours <coughs> in preparation um, after the, the first meal I, I um, drugged myself and I did actually sleep on the way back, uh, but also I managed to finish up to episode 5 of The Last of Us by the time we land as well. Um, so much so that I want to watch, oh, um, I need to find the other ones and watch the rest of it once again. Can't reiterate how much I enjoyed that series and how well done it is. Um, landed in Melbourne, where unfortunately I had a uh, went through customs and everything like that and I landed on Melbourne on Wednesday so completely and utterly missed Tuesday because obviously going the opposite way um, and I had a nine hour wait in Melbourne uh, it wasn't too bad, had a meal uh, walked around a bit um, sat and tried to do some dev but my eyes were very tired uh, by that stage um, but personally short, um, had a bit of a crash just probably about two hours before the plane Bought another coffee, struggled through, and caught that last flight home. And um, my um, sec uh, number three daughter uh, nicely was waiting for me there at the airport and gave me a lift home. So I arrived at my house in Hobart, Tasmania at about 8pm on the Wednesday. Uh, very tired. Um, but, you know, very excited to have gone on that trip. And, uh, yes, and then I had work for the next two days. <laughs> so this is the Saturday after then when I'm recording this. So a wonderful trip. Um, would I go again? Yes, definitely. I would definitely love to go again. Um, probably if I went again, I would have my own stall um, and, uh, you know, take over some of my homebrew products. Uh, but I'd love to go over again and meet up with some of those guys. I'm sure most of them would love to. Um, love to go as well and it's a great event John done, has done an absolutely awesome job putting the show together and the show has grown 
this is the first time it's at this much larger venue. Uh, they moved it early in the year because of the heat um, around the event, the previous, and the other venue just wasn't big enough. Uh, scale comes with its problems, like the you know the problems they had with the security on the first day. They have to have security because a lot of cosplay are theirs, and they have weapons, so all of those weapons need to be checked. So <coughs> that's the um, you know cosplay brings the numbers in the people in, and also adds a bit of flavour and character to the um, show. And um, but uh, you know comes with caveats. Now there was a very large guest area there with lots of voice actors. Um, I met the gentleman who did the art for the Tron arcade game and Satan's Hollow, which was really good. I really couldn't afford to get a signature off him. I really would have loved to get him to sign a Tron banner or a Satan's Hollow banner, but I was worried about how in the world would I get it home without damaging it. I probably should have. He was a really nice guy. I talked to him for um, quite a while as well. And no, I didn't do a lot of selfies with people. Actually, the only one I did was uh, Johnny Millennium. And John Hancock did one with me. I don't have that picture either. But, I mean, I'm not a selfie, you know, type of guy. <coughs> I'm, you know, underlying a little shy. So maybe next time I go, I'll rectify that. But I had an absolute blast. I really enjoyed it. Um, I would do it again. And it has refreshed me in that there are people out there that like the stuff that I do um, and I really want to make 2024 the year um, that I push on and get more of my homebrew games released um, and actually on the trip home I've already done quite a few edits on the Coleco games book because I'm going to release a new edition of that one that'll be Amazon print on demand because all the print copies have sold out um, <coughs> and um Obviously, I learnt a lot making my current book, so just applying that sort of editing technique to it. So that'll be out, I was saying, by the end of the year, but I might have that out in a couple of months. We never know. All right. I hope you enjoyed this very long waffle. We will go into the walk-around footage with a bit of background music for support, but that's provided completely as an extra. And I do apologise for my amateur iPhone camera skills. Um, but I tried to capture as many of the vendors as I could and to get you a general feel of how big the hall was. Alright, well, let's go do that now. Mm -hmm. 